This short code podcast is a proud member of the MedEd Media Network. Inspiration, information, and guidance on your journey to medical school and beyond at MedEdMedia.com. Meandering in the margins of medicine, it's the Short Code Podcast. Weird news, fresh views, helpful clues, and interviews. By students, for students. Subscribe to our weekly show at theshortcode.com. Welcome back to the Short Code Podcast, a production of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. I'm Dave Etler in the studio today and live streaming on our Facebook group, the Short Code Student Lounge, Rising M2, Nicole Hines. That's that's my year. Hi. And like a rock, it's MD PhD student Aline Sanduk. Oh hi. Another MD PhD student Miranda Skeen is back. Hello. And AJ Chowdhury is joining us on the internet. Yo uh, yo. From the DC area, where he's gone to live with his parents <laughs> for reasons best understood by him. Because after college, I could never go home and live with my parents. That's not Dude, a thing. I'm living the yeah. dream. I'm a musician living in my mom's basement. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. So many success stories. Yeah. Start off that way, Dave. <laughs> exactly. Oh, whatever. Exactly. We'll, we'll see you on uh, VH1. What was that VH1 show? Behind VH1 the music. Behind the, yeah. Oh, my behind God. Oh, my God. I forgot about it. I was going to make the reference, but I didn't know if anyone... Because they're not this, still on. No, 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 no. If this, if this med school thing doesn't work out for you. Before we start, we need to hear from our listeners. Comments, topic suggestions, rants, raves. Most important, your questions. Uh, send all those things to shortcoats at gmail.com. So our show can be what you want it to be about and not some aimless drivel that I came up with. Uh, speaking of which, y'all, I was creeping around Reddit and saw a post from a forlorn medical student that had me concerned. A third year who is at who said they were at rock bottom. They're an M3 preparing to take step two in a month. They said a bunch of people in their family were sick or had died. Their marriage was crumbling. They have a two-year-old. They were having trouble with mental health, concentrating, doing the medical school things. Self-hatred, hopelessness, no motivation. They have their sights on a competitive specialty, but were anxious about that. Their support system is non-existent. I gave my advice because their whole situation scares the shit out of me. Yes. But I was wondering what you would suggest they do. What would be their next step? Dave, talk I'm talk to your dean of students. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to find out your username. Don't. Someday. <laughs> Don't every right every now. internet person's nightmare is being discovered. Yeah, it's their... being found out. Oh lord. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, my first thought was therapy, but like just but that I feel is like a baseline suggestion for just everybody in the world. Just yeah. do it. Just get therapy. I would say talk to the dean of students yeah. like as soon as possible mm-hmm. and just be level with, with them about what you're going on. To what, to what end? On. I mean, do, do, would you have a goal there? I need a minute. Yeah, yeah. They, I need a second to figure some stuff out because I want to do the best I can in med school, and right now I'm not. I think mm-hmm. they're also the ones who present you your options. Yeah. If you have to make any adjustments. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So just starting there, they can help you like gauge what you might need. Yeah. The aim just being like, I am having, I have exceptional circumstances and I am not able to perform. How can I move forward from this? Because like you, definitely someone who's familiar with your school and your circumstances will be much better versed than the internet strangers of Reddit. As much as I love them, I am a Redditor myself and they know. are wonderful people, but I don't know that this person was asking for advice. Particularly, they just wanted to, I don't know, they, they said they just wanted to vent. What and I can sub was it? Uh, medical school. Oh. Oh. And that was true off my chest or something <laughs> oh, like that. Oh, yeah. Which like, is known for, like, I just need to get some stuff out there and I need a little support. But med school, are you sure they weren't asking for advice? I don't know. It was It was kind of like couched in a like i don't know what to do so you know that implies I mean, maybe looking for advice but my also. second point would be to get off of our med school because the some of those subreddits <laughs> i have found in my life they are vats of toxicity so toxic. yeah i avoid it as they much actually as let can. off with that observation <laughs> yeah they, they are tox they are the toxic waste barrels that harley quinn jumped into like they oh are <laughs> yeah deep, they, deep cut right there yeah. deep cut. Yeah. Mm. my advice to this person was it's time for a tactical retreat. You know, as Aline suggested, take a minute. Mm-hmm. Hearing this story, the warning lights are flashing for them. It's time to pay attention. But there, I think there's still time to act, right? Not just for mental health reasons, although that's important, but also because to hear them tell their story, there haven't been any harmful effects on their education yet. Mm-hmm. 
yet. Which is the per- yeah the perfect time to intervene mm-hmm. before things you know become irreparable. Yeah. Yeah, and they're about to take step two mm-hmm. in a month, which is an important exam. And my fear would be that, you know, they'd get a shitty step two score or heaven forbid, not pass. Mm -hmm. And then their competitive specialty dreams might be affected or over. I have have a question about applying to residency in competitive fields when it comes to students who had to step away. Yeah. How does having that on your application play into things? Is it how you frame it or? I think everything is how you frame it. Yeah. I'm not an expert in in that part of it. But my understanding is that people take breaks. Yeah, life There there are tons of reasons why people take leaves. Yeah. 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 And I don't think on your MSP we would say, you know, took a break because of mental health reasons. I mean, they would just say they were granted a leave of absence Mm -hmm. between X and X. Mm-hmm. In general, people take leaves for all kinds of reasons. Lots of people get their residency anyway. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if the wanting to go into a competitive specialty yeah, is well, going to drive a lot of like those decisions and how like yeah. based in reality the thought process making those decisions is. Mm-hmm. If it's like perceived pressure or if it's like legitimate if I do this, it won't go well for my application yeah i mean perception mm-hmm. is the person you're talking about the perception of the person who's having the difficulty yeah, yeah. like like you're, you're worrying it's going to be one way right. but in reality that's not how it would turn out yeah well as a born catastrophizer <laughs> i can tell you rarely have my catastrophic predictions of in my own life come true and i think that's probably true for most people but yeah, the strategic retreat, you know, like if you wait too long, the likelihood increases that there will be something they'll need to explain away when they're applying to residency. Bad step two score, bad grade leading to a visit to the promotions committee, repeating a clerkship or some other really negative consequence that'll be hard to recover from. That'll be harder to recover from more than just taking a step back. You know, I think Amy Ahern's advice, like uh, for people applying to med school, talking about like certain events in their lives. Like She's her, our admissions assistant director. Yeah. Her advice, I remember, and I thought it was like directly applicable to this is like nothing. It Nothing is but the way that you that's a weird way to phrase things. <laughs> Spin it in the right way. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. say like, hey, I needed time off and like look at how much better and stronger I got yeah. afterwards. Like, but also I had a lot of growth during that time. But also because there haven't been any negative, I assume there haven't been any negative effects to their education, you know, like a bad grade or whatever yet, they can retreat and do whatever they want at this point. You know, do a year of research. You know, a lot get, of people do that. That's actually. smart. Yeah. yeah. Or and, just take a year to take care of yourself. Or just take a year to take care of <laughs> yeah. yourself. And your damn with, self. Like with what's going on with the family, the marriage. Oh, yeah. Like, I, think, I, I think this person could say, you know, my family was having a lot of trouble mm-hmm. and I needed to take some time to help them out, be of assistance. Yeah. Like literally any one of those things by themselves would be fantastic su- reason to take this. Yeah. Right. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. 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 And if you're worried about like, oh, gosh, I mean, it'll take me a, an extra year to be a doctor or whatever. A year. <laughs> if, it's you, a year. if you let yourself to dec- decline to the point where you hurt someone else. That's actually hurt, really important. Or you hurt yourself, whether yeah. it's hurting your chances of doing what you want to do, getting to the point where you hurt yourself physically. If you don't stop before you get to that point, everything else you were planning for could be in jeopardy. Yeah. The also, stakes just get higher and yeah. higher. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And it just comes becomes harder and harder to climb back out of it as mm-hmm. well. Like better to just like slow the free fall now, mm-hmm. figure out how to open your parachute. I'm getting lost in the metaphor, but yeah. Hey man, I, it all, sounded good. All to say I agree yeah. with what you are saying. Yes. <laughs> um You can't take care of your patients if you can't take care of yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. I also wanted to say that you know if you're having trouble and you're thinking about such a tactical retreat people are not going to some people are not going to help they will give you bad advice they will say things like oh i don't know that's a risky choice you know they'll see it as you failing 
Yeah. Yeah. I was going to yeah. say, like, look at the way all of us respond. We were immediately like, take some time off. Like, yeah. Without hesitation, we all kind of said that. The people who see it as you failing are the people you don't want to surround yourself in mm-hmm. when yes. you're in that state mm-hmm. and in that moment. That's a good litmus test for who to stay the hell away from, you know, when you're <laughs> okay. having a hard time. Yeah, day. use this as your test for other people. Like, so what do you right. think I should do? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, go down your friends list with a checklist and be like, okay, nope, nope, yep, nope. Not you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, you're, you, what you're doing here is you're altering your course to steer around the iceberg. That's Ooh. going to, you know, sink you. And that, that is fine. That is actually smart. Yes. <laughs> It is not a failure. Yeah, like you did not make the iceberg show up, but you can control how you react to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the thing I was going to add is that I guarantee you're going to have a patient dealing with one of those things at some point in your life. And like, look what a better provider that person is going to be to be like, I mean, don't say like, yeah, I've been through the same thing, but say, Mm -hmm. I can only imagine how difficult this is, but they'll mean it. Yeah. They'll actually be able to imagine. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. That's crazy to think about. Like, medical students that don't take care of themselves take time off from school and continue to pound through their training and end up becoming a shell of who they were before they started medical training Mm -hmm. and then we are expected to go tell our patients who may have just as stressful lives hey take a break even though i haven't taken a break in the last 15 years you need to do it yeah i I actually, when I was doing, that reminded me when I was in pre-med, actually, I was doing an MCAT prep course. And one of the things that they were talking about, and one of the first things was, you know, make sure that you're still like taking time off to like get exercise, eat healthy, do things. Because eventually you're going to be in the position of, and at the time I kind of rolled my eyes like, okay, yeah, whatever, lady, I'm here to study for a test. But looking back on it, I'm thinking that was really good advice because eventually you're going to be in the position of having to help people continue to make healthy decisions so like if you can't do it for yourself how are you going to help anybody else do that so it really is important to as the wise airline safety videos have all often said put your own mask on first we we use that a lot when we talk about our children like i'm hungry putting masks on your kids dave no (laughs) i'm hungry i'm gonna eat first then you eat because if i don't eat right now no i'm just kidding (laughs) There may not be enough supplies, and I am the provider. Uh, the, <laughs> I get dinner first. DCS I don't want to have to eat your up. children. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I know, tactical retreats, retreats are pretty valuable in other situations, too, right? I mean... Oh, yeah. I have no idea so, what a tactical retreat so is. So this is a... I, I keep saying this, but it is a it is something I lifted from from the military, which I have no involvement in. Like and I have no, like, But basically, it's a way of saying, you know, going backwards because... We need to go forwards. Mm-hmm. Basically taking a minute to get ourselves out of this situation that sucks mm-hmm. and allowing us to get to to move into a new situation that doesn't suck. Yeah. It's common to get bogged down in your circumstances and never realizing that you have you do have the power mm-hmm. to uh, stop and consider a different move. Yeah. And there's no shame in it. It's actually, as we said, a sign of strength. There are tactical retreats in research in relationships and negotiations, all kinds of situations where it's completely acceptable and a good idea to step back. Yeah. Lose the battle, but win the war. Yes, exactly. Perfect analogy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's, wouldn't it almost be like winning that battle because you did the right things to overcome it? I mean, I'm thinking more in like, I'm thinking I'm Alexander the Great and I'm fighting against the Persian Empire yeah. and like, yeah. I like I am forced into a retreat, but by retreating, I am saving my horses and troops so that I can go back, recoup, and I still have enough soldiers and troops to actually hit them with a better strategy next time. Makes sense. I just, I, I can't view it as losing like yeah I, obviously I the that, metaphor yeah. is not the same. It yeah. is not losing, but it isn't but losing. That, it's, it's, that's I, where I was any, thinking from. any. I think probably any military commander would not look at it as a loss. Mm -hmm. They would look at it as exactly conserving your resources so that you can come back and fight another day situation. I I think it works, though, because I don't know if I would have called myself Alexander the Great. I think you're (laughs) being very uh, uh, egotistical. (laughs) Are you calling me Alexander? No, I'm calling myself Alexander the Great. (laughs) (laughs) I'm fabulous. Are you kidding me? All right. But like 
I think it is valuable to acknowledge that even though you may know intellectually, like, yes, I am doing the smart thing. I am taking time for myself. It still doesn't feel good. Well, it's very like, true. It feels like you're giving in. It feels like you're losing something, even though you may know you're not. So I think there is something to be acknowledged in the fact that, like, yeah, it's fine to feel like this is a loss. And, yeah. you know, it still sucks. It's a bad situation, but, but it's also, still not your fault. And it's still a smart decision. When you're having uh, mental health difficulties, especially depression and some other things, it's actually, it used to be described as a thought disorder. I don't know if it still is, but but part of the problem is that you are having a thought disorder. Because you're in this condition, you're predisposed to thinking of things in an incorrect way. Sure. Basically, yeah. you're evaluating your situation incorrectly. And so, yeah, you're going to think of it as, it's hard not to think of it as a loss. You, you have primed yourself to think of things in terms of winning and, lo- and losing. Yeah. It. It's definitely a long mental process to go from taking a leave is the worst thing I could possibly do. I'm terrified of it mm-hmm. to recognizing that or even just like a step back, a change in your schedule, whatever it looks like yeah. to accepting this is the best thing I can do for myself, my education, my future. Like, And if like you said, if you're struggling with mental health and your thought patterns aren't Mm-hmm. the best I'll, I'll just say it like that You're it right. takes it takes a long yeah. it takes a long time yeah mm-hmm. i think there's also the importance of perspective with specifically with regards to being a medical student and being in this pressure cooker of medical training where taking a leave of absence may be the best idea but the thought process behind making that decision might require you to actually go outside of your bubble of classmates and faculty that you can trust in to talk about these things because at the end of the day the average medical student probably went through their whole life being at the top of the top the cream of the crop they have been told that they're the best they're good and then they come into medical school and you have over a hundred of these people all shoved into the same room and then be told you're average now and that is (laughs) a very very upsetting thing for a lot of people to experience and then you come into yeah. clinic and then you eventually recover in preclinicals from that and end up doing well on your test maybe maybe not uh, everybody has a different path towards it but then in clinic you're actually interacting with all these people and you're told again and again by attendings by residents by just people that you interact with there that you're average or you're not even worth being here yeah and that's a really really self-defeating thing to take super seriously like yes you should care about your education but it's also within your power to take hold of it and take the perspective of this is going to be a ongoing process for the rest of my life it's okay if i take a break because when i come back i'm going to be able to hit it way harder than i did before because now i have the tools to do it properly Mm -hmm. yeah i think you're hitting on a very important point about internalizing the lifestyle and the messaging that we get from our profession and thinking like i am bad as opposed to like no this process is bad or the situation that i am in is bad Mm -hmm. or the situation i'm in is bad yeah it's worth reflecting it's like taking the taking whatever is going on and removing um the emotion from it and just seeing what is actually going on here is it truly all my fault and i think i sent you a meme about this where it's like <laughs> just reword the situation you go from having depression to no depression mm-hmm. are you talking about me specifically yeah oh yeah oh. <laughs> i think i remember that one ag sends me a lot of memes this Goodness is how we as millennials communicate it's mainly just like sending memes <laughs> are you so are you talking about like reframing your thoughts into something more positive exactly. yeah yeah. It's a really it's a really good thing to And practice. also removing the you yeah. from your situation. Right. Depersonalizing yeah. it. But also like being conscious about those thoughts about other people as well can do a lot yeah, for you. Absolutely. You know, the other thing we haven't explicitly mentioned but are like kind of talking about a little bit is identity. I think in a lot of people feeling like needing a break or needing to take time off threatens their identity as like a high powered, highly effective, like highly productive person. Cause that's, that's often the mental block I run into is like, if I don't do this, I don't know who I am. So I did take a leave. And when I came back, I restarted the year that I was doing when I took my leave. And I had finished one course through that time. So I didn't have to redo that one, but I had to do all the other coursework that I'd already done. And so 
starting with my new group of classmates, they all had this extra course and I couldn't relate mm-hmm. when they were like the night before a test and stressing the amount of ge- balancing and juggling. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't feel like my identity was the same as my classmates mm. who were in my same year. And it took like getting past the point that I took my leave to feel like I was one of them. And it's nothing that anybody was doing to me, but just it, it does affect your perception and something that like, yeah, not, also- not just like what you think is going to do to your identity, but the actual impact it has and how you have to work through coming back from that. Thousand percent. Yeah, so you're saying that the identity you're speaking of here is as a member of a class. Yeah. A group of people, a group of friends. You see whatever. you see the people who were your classmates moving on and going beyond, and then you come back, and their second year, your first year, you have a whole new group, but that's who you knew as your classmates, and yeah. so it's like still kind of weird to see them around. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, How do the MSTPs feel about that? <sighs> I was going to say, I didn't know if it was super relevant, but like, yeah, because when I left to do my PhD and I mean, most of my friends from med school are still around, like for goodness sakes, I still do yoga with two of them like twice a week, but it is weird because we used to just do all everything all the time together. We'd like hang out in the learning communities. We'd go get like beers after a test. It was great. And now they're walking around in scrubs and talking about like uh, the sutures I had to do in surgery today. And I'm here like. I did a Western. I <laughs> I read a PCR. <laughs> I did a PCR. Uh, <laughs> and it, it is, it really does kind of, like, I find myself almost kind of caught between those worlds of, like, part of me is a grad student working on getting my PhD, and then the other part of me is still a med student hanging out with my med school friends and talking about how silly all of the, all the step exams are. So it really is this weird, like, splintering off of your identity. Is it something that, mstp students ever talk about with each other or that the program ever talks about with you well because it it varies student to student i think as well how much you bond with your classmates as well because some people are like i was super i loved my med school classmates or some of my best friends and they will continue to be my best friends after they leave and then some people more bond internally within their cohort or they have other people outside Mm -hmm. of the school who they hang out so it's kind of depends how deep you choose to get into each little pie you have your finger in yeah i'd agree with that completely oh aline at this point the people you thought who, i'd have more to say no i was gonna say <laughs> at, this, at this point the people who you were with in the first cup in the first two years would be my boss i have yeah. graduated <laughs> it's like thanks they're, dave for reminding me how old i am <laughs> but, they're, but, but they're gone i mean it's not just mm-hmm. that they're not part of your class anymore they have moved on to their professional lives you know i was just like i didn't seek it out but on my facebook feed someone that i started med school with like some pictures of hers popped up and i think it's okay to say i'm not it, it's totally be personalized but she had come into med school married and then met someone here and they you know got divorced and then i guess she like officially married this person and they both live in a much sunnier state than we live in and it's you know it's so bittersweet because like she was a she's a great person. I'm really happy for her to see like, you know, she's married. She's got this great job. She's making good money. And then part of me is like, I want that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to be at that place. But yeah, all, all of my friends right now are at the point where they're starting their residency applications. And they're all talking about personal statements and where they're applying. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't leave me. Yeah. No. Yeah. You're yeah. all going to go to a different state. You know crazy to think about? MSTPs, when they start their start med school, their graduating classmates were probably sophomores in college when they started med school. I find this happens uh, to me all the time. Oh, AJ, I see. I but see. in my case, it's like, like who they end up graduating Sorry, I with. That's just uh, I, wouldn't it be freshmen in college? Because it's it's four extra years on top of med school. I mean, depending on how fast you get through the PhD part. I guess freshmen and sophomores in college, depending on how fast you get through your PhD. Yeah. That's true. I can thanks relate to again that. for that. By the way, to add to my ongoing existential crisis, many thanks. I'm sorry. We're, <laughs> we're here to help on the short code podcast. I get that feeling, but in a very different way. Where young people talk about being old, and me being like, I have shirts older than you. Yeah. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> Oh, I have chronic back pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, good for you. All right, all right. You're not you're not one of these people. You know, something I do wish the MSTP did a better job of was encouraging 
self-reflection in like a meaningful way and, mm-hmm. and you know maybe the med school I don't know I haven't been in the med school area in a while but we get a lot of mixed messages from our profession from our institutions about like hey take care of yourself but also never say no to me you know yeah never pass up an opportunity you need these to be successful like yeah. you need to go to these conferences yeah I say no a lot people I love this <laughs> go off sis I love it I mean people make requests and look it, it's a little selfish because like the program depends on people you know supplying the labor for these things but like I'm also six years in I've done that and it's very polite and respectful and I say hey thank you for thinking of me but the answer is no mm-hmm. and then the craziest thing and it it's a good litmus test for that person's character based on how they respond when you like keep a thing away from them that they want. Cause like some people will just move on. Other people will just like come back and be like, what do you mean? No. Mm-hmm. And some people will come back ignoring completely the known being like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Anyway. So here's the link to the thing you need to do. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, 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 uh. did do you, yeah. Did you not, did you just not read the email or are you just being mean on purpose? So yeah, mm-hmm. it's okay to to say no and to prioritize. But like but some people really thrive on doing everything all the time and that's okay too. But yeah, I wish it's I, important. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, sorry. I, I kind of went off on like a rant, but I do I do wish that was a bigger part of our training was um Oh geez, I feel like I got way off track, but we were kind of talking self reflection. Yeah, self reflection, and uh, no, what I was think the what thing? you're talking like about establishing boundaries. Well, it's also yeah. Yeah, I, exactly. identity. Yeah, figuring out who you want to be and what's right for you, and not conforming to what you should do or what you think you know people want you to do. Which comes back to our conversation around taking leave. You know, yeah. a lot of people think you shouldn't, and who cares what they think? I think it's also maybe a little bit about boundaries. understanding your yeah. value. Yeah. Your, your value as a person, as a colleague and all that kind of stuff and being like, I don't have to do everything that you want me to do. I am valuable to myself. The thing I was looking up earlier, I could not agree more. And I know I've monopolized the conversation. I'll say this last thing and then I'll let Stop it. other people think. <laughs> but, Just kidding. Um, looking up an Audre Lorde quote as we were talking, which all right, you're shaking your head like, OK, you, maybe you'll know what I'm about to say. I don't know if it's like the right quote, but she was like a black feminist lesbian in the 60s and a philosopher, just an incredible person. And she got breast cancer. And in the 60s and 70s, it was very unusual. Like, first off, it was unusual to get a mastectomy, but she only got the one. And she was like, I'm not going to cut off my healthy boob just to conform to what your ideal of a woman is. Mm -hmm. And one of the quotes that sticks out in my mind that's just beautiful is it's a little political, but in a capitalist system, self-care is an act of subversion. Right. Yeah. 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 And I was like, that's cool. If I may, I kind of, I just thought of something that I would like to share with you, which I thought was interesting when, and we were talking about identity and boundaries. It occurred to me, there's been a thing going around lately where people like, and I've noticed this in some of the spaces I run in, there's a lot more people that have started to realize that they might be like LGBT through quarantine and it's this weird phenomenon of like well are people just like on the internet and getting exposed to and that's part of it but the other part i think might be well when i don't have all of these other pressures in my identity and i focus on myself they're suddenly like oh crap like (laughs) there's a thing in here i haven't dealt with yet and i should probably like work through i mean it happened to me in quarantine so there's a certain amount of like it's very interesting yeah of like, oh, hi. Oh, by the way, uh, happy Pride to all of our listeners. Yes. Oh, it's yeah. It's our first episode we're recording in June. So happy Pride, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Oh, That's my way yeah. of shoehorning in well <laughs> Pride done. Month. Well done. In the conversation. Subtle. So, you know, thank you. I try. Yeah. I just want to add something. I'd like to piggyback off what Miranda's saying. Melissa Phoebos is a writer actually who lives in Iowa City. And Kate and I were talking about an article she wrote probably a couple of weeks ago talking about how it was in quarantine that she realized just how much unwanted touch we consent to in our everyday Mm -hmm. lives and it wasn't until she didn't have to be around any of that touch for over a year that she was like oh this is what it feels like to only be touched when you want to be touched this is great i don't like i i don't want to go back to that other life where people i'm not a woman i don't understand people touch other people without dude constantly people constantly share their germs yes actually you know what shaking hands is the dumbest thing ever i broke my hand during my med school interviews and my best interviews were when i was in a cast (laughs) (laughs) hands didn't have to worry about like my clammy hands touching them them getting grossed out 
it was yeah. awesome we yeah. should keep that there there was so much like okay you're still gonna see some family members but you won't hug like you won't do any of that and it, i i went back home this weekend and actually for the first time I, I hug my grandpa and then my grandma goes to hug me she hesitates she does it and then she looks at me again and she kisses me on the cheek and she goes I remember there was a time where you really didn't like being touched because at church every Sunday she would come and like touch my back, touch my shoulders and I would like squirm away mm-hmm. and I didn't have the heart to tell her like, yeah, that's it's that's rich. me. And I still like, yeah. obviously I went in for a hug with her, but I still don't want people to just come up and then, oh, my feelings are hurt because you're squirming away. Like, no, I get this yeah. autonomy and I get to say whether or not you touch me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got to talking to you when I was younger about doing that and how yeah. it was hurting my grandma's feelings. I can completely relate to this in kind of an interesting way. And I'm seeing this like these scenarios pop up on Facebook a lot where parents of like young female children are encouraging them to say like, no, I don't want to hug grandma mm-hmm. or grandpa. Yeah. And I was like, going to say it's, it's very difficult for me because I want to hug. I'm a hugger. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we try not to make that a yeah. thing that like if, if you one don't, must do if you don't want to hug uncle makes me uncomfortable or aunt always pinches my cheeks you don't have to <laughs> like that's okay yeah let me take a break here because i need to say that today's show is sponsored by panacea financial a company founded by two doctors who were frustrated as medical trainees uh, that banks didn't seem to understand their unique needs in the medical field so they built a company just for medical students and doctors With nationwide digital banking, Panacea Financial provides medical students with free checking that includes no ATM fees nationwide, high-yield savings accounts, a free personal banker, around-the-clock customer support with loans designed with you in mind. No one should borrow more than they need. But with Panacea Financial, fourth-year medical students can get money as needed in as little as 24 hours with their PRN personal loan. What's PRN stand for? As needed. Yeah. Yeah. And and why is it what PRN is it is it, is it Latin? Latin? Oh, I think it is. It's Latin something. It's like per no no no. Pro Renata. Yeah, per... Pro Renata? Yeah. You, Hang see? on. Look, look at AJ googling. AJ, AJ's... <laughs> well, I mean, I look, he's got all that okay, free time living with his parents. So. And I went, oh yeah, it just you're being whenever. pimped on Latin. Ah, uh, Pro Renata. That's what he said. <laughs> oh well. Instead of running, I up, didn't hear. I was too busy googling myself. <laughs> Instead of running up credit card debt, try their PRN personal loan that is designed to give you a better way to cover expenses such as residency applications and relocation or board exams. Some customers actually use it to pay off toxic credit card debt. In addition, medical students can have a period of no or reduced payment on their PRN personal loan. Join the growing number of medical students and physicians nationwide that expect more from their bank. Go to PanaceaFinancial.com today to open your free account. Panacea Financial is a division of premise member FDIC. Ooh. Thank you for allowing me to take that break. And thank you, Panacea Financial. Appreciate that. Thank you for the money. Yes. <laughs> what else do we have to say about this topic today? I think it was a really nice place where we landed of like, yeah. you know, cut out the noise. Think about what you really want. Don't focus too much on what other people feel you should do or want you to do. Because at the end of the day, you're the one who's going to live the experience. And there's no shame in that. There's no shame in anything except like murder. And you're not killing anyone <laughs> by doing this, you know? There is a little shame in murder. <laughs> a little bit. And even then, depends if you take on the nothing else from today's podcast, listeners, yes. there is shame in this murder. Is our, this is our takeaway for the show, too. <laughs> but only a little. Yes. Just a little. You guys, bad news. A study out of Brown University has shown that despite more than 20 years of medical schools talking about diversity, medicine's most underrepresented groups are still declining yep they used double amc data and found that black males in medical school have decreased from 3.1 percent in 1978 to 2.9 in 2019 what i'm laughing because like as soon as when you were halfway through that sentence and like aj just started cracking his knuckles then he took a sip of his drink <laughs> next so we're gonna see him roll like, up his sleeves sit, uh, you know sit the hell down I everybody hour-long call about this <laughs> native american and native alaskan students have also decreased now below one really? percent hispanic and native hawaiian or pacific islanders have seen sharp decreases too the researchers are calling it a persistent failure of diversity efforts clearly what's going on here like i, I hear talk about diversity all the time what are we doing wrong 
I guess it doesn't matter if you open the door, if the door is on the fourth floor and that person can't walk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of how I take that. In medicine, especially in the U.S., there is a fundamental foundational flaw starting from as soon as you're born. Like, there are running jokes about how you need to have a high APGAR score to make it into med school nowadays because it's just gotten so competitive. And the thing is, we're failing our future physicians of color and our patients of color by still enabling that system like you guys Mm -hmm. said you're opening the door but who's going to be able to make it to the fourth floor not Mm -hmm. somebody who there's no way of them actually making it up there it's going to be that person who's in great shape and can sprint up the stairs to the fourth floor they're going to get accepted well before anyone else can because there's no means and i hope that metaphor wasn't like insulting to anyone did not intend it as such there is no mean systematically in the U.S. from the very moment we're born and assigned our racial demographic. And unfortunately, there's usually an inherent set of traits, socioeconomic status, qualities that you are labeled with and provided because of what skin color you are when you're born mm-hmm. or uh, your ethnicity. And the problem is we don't have any kind of initiatives that start that early in medicine we don't have initiatives where medical students are going out into the communities, communities full of like immigrants, communities full of people of color, going out and showing them like, hey, there's no reason to be distrustful of healthcare. We are out here to help and we want you to join us because then you can also help and take care of the community of people that look like you. Mm -hmm. I think well and it doesn't help that like there's still possibly for many people of color there may be a reason to fear healthcare. like like if you are a black woman yes healthcare is a big reason for you to be afraid there is still a lot of bias in medicine so there might I think that might play a role in terms of people people just don't trust us which is honestly fair no that's very true and that's a strong point like there are several institutions that have been known to horrifically take advantage of the local people of color in their communities for science and um, unfortunately it is true that like there are reasons to be mistrustful and that's why we need more representation yes. with physicians of color scientists of color healthcare workers of color so that we can start breaking these issues i think of it as like there was probably some meeting way back when with like the tuskegee syphilis study where they went oh these people are not actually people and everyone else yeah. in the room, nobody looked like the mm-hmm. people that they were studying. Nobody had those lived experiences. They probably all were like, yeah, you know what? That checks out. That's okay. Let's do it. Because mm-hmm. there's nobody there to break that agreement, that, that echo chamber of less experiment on African-Americans for science. There's so much truth to what AJ said, like starting from the time you're born. Mm-hmm. If, I don't know what like studied is like the effect that the zip code you're born in and like the upward mobility you can have in life Mm -hmm. not necessarily talking about that but like a same line of thought like where you're born determines what school district you're in and if you're in a school district that's not well performing that doesn't teach you how to study well then you go on to college and you start those i hate the term weed out courses yeah Mm -hmm. and if you don't know how to study if you weren't prepared for college you're at a disadvantage again Mm-hmm. and you need to be getting the grades as well and they they just compound there and then as representation declines like aj said there weren't people that looked like the people that they were talking about yeah mm-hmm. just as important like having young kids see doctors that look like them to know like i can do this to have mentors encourage you and tell you how to do it if you don't have somebody in your life that's part of the healthcare system like for classmates who have parents who are physicians they know so much more about the process of like step exams residency and probably not all of them but compared to me who didn't have any family members they were leaps and bounds ahead just walking into orientation yeah and i i don't remember what group it is that's working on this but i think the focus is just in the wrong place like getting medical mm-hmm. students out there to sh- like to say like hey this is where i am you could be here too someday yeah or to just walk side by side but if we don't have the percent and the representation and it keeps declining how are you going to build it yeah 
Mm-hmm. And there's there's the element of like when it comes to applications as well, there have been some things where, you know, you can talk about how your like background has affected your education. You can like I, I don't know if they've taken names off of applications when they review them. I imagine that would be helpful as well. But there's a certain extent where when we're talking about, you know, you're born into like the bad zip code, which means you don't get the best schools, which means you don't get the best college prep, which means you don't get um, the best med school prep. So there's that extent of compounding, but we haven't actually changed where the gate is. So it's like we were kind of aware that like, oh, yeah, this is definitely biased towards people who are born of certain demographics. But like that core part of the admission criteria hasn't really been changed. So I think yeah, I think that's where a lot of the problem lies is the yeah. admissions criteria. But oh, absolutely. Yeah, because like, it doesn't really matter if you say like, oh, yeah, my diversity is like my background is impacted in this way when you still have like the overall admission system bias towards people who were born into more advantageous circumstances so it's like you you have like you're like a little bit there of like at least you acknowledge the fact that it can be a problem but you still haven't actually altered anything about the way you actually admit people and i don't know if there's a solution for that but i was gonna say i wonder how you i mean yeah like I mean, other than just the whole job of the admissions the admissions committee in whatever school you're in is to select people who can succeed Mm -hmm. and the only way that you have to do that in a practical matter without interviewing every single person on the planet is looking at things like scores and metrics and personal statements and just the historical aspects of your application and and then deciding who to interview it's a tough nut to crack yeah, other than removing systemic racism, I'm not Which sure. Which is what a goal. Meta- like, it is a goal, let's but say that that's a we're goal. failing at that goal. Yeah. And I, I think another part of it might, and I'm not going to sit here and say that on the Short Code podcast, we are going to solve the diversity problem in medical school, but. No, especially I, as a bunch of, you know, mostly white people yeah, on the, yeah, that are I, on the show. I'm very aware that this is not my arena to speak as an expert in, yeah. but in a way, because I'm thinking about things where like there is a lot of work that you do if you come from like a disadvantaged background that you can't put on a resume, you can't put in a personal statement because they don't want to see it. It's like we should have somewhere where you can put that kind of work that you like, maybe you had to like take care of relatives. Maybe you had to like, you know, you had a back. I I don't know. Like I said, I'm coming up short, but like there should be more opportunity to express that kind of stuff because all of that stuff will lead you to success. Like clearly you have spent a lot of time working and I am grateful that to a certain extent, it seems like applications are putting less emphasis on things like MCAT scores, which I think is a good thing. But yeah, at the same time, I think there could be ways where we acknowledge work that does maybe doesn't look good on a resume. It's like, yeah, that wasn't a scientific experience, but it is an experience that will put you in a good position. Yeah, I agree. Something I remember from when I was in college, which was a long time ago, and I don't know if it's still done, but I remember when I was applying to colleges, they asked, you know, about like the typical scores and metrics and things like that. But they would also ask things like, you know, is advanced placement or IB available at your school? And yeah. did you take those classes? Or like, what was the scale, you know, on which your GPA was scored? So like, they cared about the number, but they were also willing, anyway, the schools I applied to, to put it in context and be like, okay, this person comes from an area of the country or, you know, the area of the state that doesn't do super well, but considering where they are, did they maximize their potential given what was available to them? And I really liked that a lot. You know, interesting development this year is that a lot of, or I don't know about a lot, but several schools were getting rid of their SAT and ACT requirements yeah. mm-hmm. for admissions, which Which I'm sure is Princeton very was very excited about. I know. <laughs> I mean, it's very interesting because, you know, test scores are problematic for people of color. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because of all the issues that we've already mentioned, if that gains momentum... It would be interesting to see. I mean, I'm pretty confident that that's not going to lead to a massive reduction in the quality of college students. 
if anything, it's an improvement. Again, I, this is going to sound like a brag, but I did fantastically on my SAT and ACT. That's just because I test well. Yeah, like I, I didn't did study well too, super hard for those. Like I barely, like I did not study more than any of my other classmates. I probably studied less. I'm just good at reading questions, yeah. and that is not an applicable skill for the career I'm in. <laughs> You know, but that's an asset in and of itself. And the the mistake that I see in the way that we pick people is that we're we have like a very specific mold, and the only people that fit that mold are the ones that we're allowing to clear the threshold. But like that's a way, you know, that's an important way of thinking. And what we need more of in med school is like all the other ways that people learn and and all the other strengths a person can bring to the table yeah. is something I've heard someone in our program say is they were very annoyed by how that by how overrepresented Mexicans were in our program because it made it a lot harder for them to stand out as a Mexican student. And I thought that was very so like a person of color <laughs> exhibiting quite a bit of privilege in that statement, you know. <laughs> okay. So point being that you know, we're not getting to the people that we really want in this profession. We're just picking yeah, the same people fitting the same mold, but just looking a little bit different, just physically look or having a different type of name. Yeah. But I'm, we're missing such an important perspective. I'm trying to I'm completely, right now. completely <laughs> under, understand like what that person was getting at. Because it seemed like they wanted to be analyzed based on the group of their identity. And yeah. that also implies that like, that same analysis is going down for all other breakups yeah. of the and that and, that that, and that part of it confuses me i wonder if that relies on like because there's like i have trolled some of the more right-winging <laughs> sides of the internet in my time as an investigative endeavor and one of the things that they say is things you know like affirmative action or diversity stuff is that they're trying to like like oh yeah you can succeed just by you know being born a person of color which is a complete misunderstanding of how the entire system works but i wonder if that might be part of where that person was coming from where it's like well yeah obviously when you invite more people of different molds you will probably have to stand out more because you need to there are a lot of different ways that you can succeed now so i i guess i can kind of see where they're coming from i just don't think that's necessarily that valid of an argument but my, so my perspective was I disagreed completely. And the reason is that that person, like what that statement betrays is that their ethnicity is an asset, like their wealth, like their appearance, like, you know, access to opportunities. Whereas like a truly underprivileged person doesn't have the privilege of using their ethnicity. It's that, hard that to explain. That tool isn't there for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. They don't like, even know that they have that. Yeah. Accessible. Yeah, exactly. Go on another monologue. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I agree with all y'all's points about this. Like, even if you're a minority, generally medical schools will select for those minorities that do have wealth and access to resources like having an MCAT course, having your parents be able to support you financially, knowing who to talk to. And I'm going to use myself as an example because I hate it when there's a generalization that just because I'm a person of color and I don't even get the privilege of being considered a minority as a Bangladeshi for AMCAS or for just medical admissions in general. So I grew up a very poor immigrant. I didn't know what the heck I was doing when applying to college. And I ended up having to spend years extra because of it in college and then after college and had to spend hours and hours upon hours on SDN, on Reddit, reading about stuff and learning it. But I didn't have any access to that or even knowledge of its existence beforehand, which could have saved me years of my life through this process mm -hmm. and saved me a lot of time and money to have that. And that is an intangible that doesn't get read on an application. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and when you talk about like years of your life, something I was reading about this morning is how far behind our generation in, is in terms of um, wealth accumulation. And like, those are income earning years that you missed out on because you kind of had to get familiar with the system and get caught up. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And that's a great Game point. to the moon, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I don't want to fault medical schools for trying, but like, especially from the way you're talking, the, the, the ways that they've gone about approaching the diversity question seem to be very much a welcome everybody. Where are they? And not actually sort of stepping outside to figure out, well, okay, we've opened up. Why aren't they coming in? And it's like, no, that 
over there they're all like they're all they're all falling into that big hole that's like this big trench that's dug in front of the door maybe we should figure something out about that like <laughs> i know, love metaphors guys that there's a diversity essay that usually the prompt is tell us about a time you've interacted with a person who is different from you that just drives me nuts because everybody is different <laughs> Aren't there from ones that are like minority here what does yeah. diversity mean to you or like yeah 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 you know what would be nice is to see like to speak to Miranda's point is to see med school is partnering with more like local community like especially in Iowa there's there is a community there are communities of color here they're very small but they do exist and and the students I think and this is the great thing about med students like we're so plastic and we're so unformed and unjaded that like it usually is med students who spearhead this. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. well, I know there's a couple of M3s in the room just like, uh-huh. Yeah, very unjaded. <laughs> specifically not speaking about myself. But um, <laughs> yeah, but you know, it. part of the problem is that when they're having these conversations about how to recruit students from these communities, they don't have anyone from that community in the room. So they're a little bit guessing what to do. So like I agree with I. This is a hard thing to do and it's not completely their fault, but the way that they're trying to do it is out of touch with reality and there's a better way. And sometimes they're willing to listen and sometimes not. Yeah. And, and it matters because look at that. We have a workforce that's, you know, all, you know, relatively homogenous and and like it is not completely homogenous, but homogenous enough that a lot of people's health concerns just aren't even on the radar Mm -hmm. of their providers because they just can't imagine what it's like to have to work three jobs and to make too much money to qualify for food stamps and to have, you know, a deadbeat parent and things like that. So I also I, I can't really speak to the funding situation for admissions departments, but money is allocated to them and they have to spend it in the most efficient way possible in order to do anything at all. And, you know, part of what admissions departments do is they travel to recruit. And I'm wondering if, you know, if if the funding isn't there, you're going to go where the yield is greatest. Right. And it may be difficult to get beyond that problem when you're saying we got all these different communities that we ordinarily wouldn't go to because you know the yield in terms of students who will apply and get in you know like you know what i'm saying like it's kind it of a chicken and egg problem it feels like money there it feels like at the same time though like yeah they're maximizing the use of that but they're also like quite literally not putting their money where their mouth is mm-hmm. like if those yeah. efforts don't reflect the message that the institution is trying to uphold it, yeah. Totally, yeah. totally. Yeah, totally. yeah. it's not just about like talking the talk, but walking the walk. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, you mean? say non performative? Yeah. Like, there's no real action being done. I've seen, like, seeing emails from institutions, organizations, corporations, whatever crap, <laughs> seeing emails like, we support diversity, and then there's nothing else to it. it it's yeah. just a message of solidarity, but no action behind it. Okay. Like, that's yeah. funny. Like, I consider. So for example, I can. No, yeah, I was gonna say I consider that performative, but I think a negative word. Like, yeah. like that's something I see as people performing. You know, caring about diversity, but not actually. Yeah. So when you said non-performative as a positive thing, or as a negative. Yeah. Yeah. You know. See, yeah, yeah. We were. We were. We're, we're saying the same thing, but with different. I, I have a question on that yeah, line yeah. specifically for AJ. Do Do you use Sketchy? I'm, I'm not trying Wait. to be an advertisement okay. or anything. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I don't I like use, sketchy, so I can. <laughs> I do not use sketchy. I use similar things, but yes, I, I know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. So I, I checked it out the other day. Like I was reading a paper for Lab Journal Club and I wanted to like see what their little sketch had on or tux map. Mm-hmm. And there's a little like disclaimer at the top saying that this doesn't meet their their standards on DEI and they will be reworking it and they have a statement on like saying we're sorry for how we've contributed these problems in medical education and we want to get better we have this button so you can report things and I didn't watch the whole thing so I didn't know exactly which parts they were saying it was like mid medieval times and yeah I was wondering I was wondering what you what you think about that I think, I think I they, they, they have somebody from, like, a, a neighboring kingdom or something bring a gift. 
It's I have no idea what you're town. talking about. Okay, so yeah, for context, because okay. uh, all of a sudden we're talking yeah. about kingdoms and what? What no, is sketchy? There, there's another really good example. So I'll do this disclaimer on sketchy and then point out one that I don't know if you've seen. Sketchy is basically they do it's they charge a lot of money to give you essentially videos that are cartoons that are supposed to help you illust- like remember mm-hmm. things like drugs and microbes, which is helpful. Oh. I just wish they wouldn't charge you two hundred bucks a pop. So but. they're like they're sort of like uh, I, I guess visual mnemonics and yeah way. it's a okay. visual mnemonic thing exactly. um, as, especially because when you watch them you see a bunch of tech errors all the time and it's like really i just gave you like 150 dollars and you couldn't bother to justify your damn words but whatever but yeah because i remember the the medieval one i don't remember that one i do remember there was one which i think they've updated because it i've only seen this on flashcards there was one that was like malaria drugs and it was all a bunch of like african princes and princesses and like it's a little yikes. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's yeah. a problematic. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. I, I mean, I get yeah, it. You know, it's, it, it's, it's like African-Americans are disproportionately more at risk. Or no, actually, well, I, I think it was yeah. just because it's like malaria is more endemic to Africa. But and it wasn't yeah. even the fact that it's like because like, I mean, African royalty is a thing. It's a thing of history. It's a really cool part of history. But it, it was more the way in which it was contrast. I, I'm. I struggled to. There might have been like a Livingston character in it, which that's very yikes. And I, I forget if that was part of it or not. So What's a Livingston character, like the British people who came in and were like, "This is nice. I'll have it." So they came to uh-huh. Africa and colonized. They colonized them. Yeah, I, I, yeah no, I, you're you're completely right, though. Thank you. Yeah, Any follow up? No. <laughs> so is is that an example of like? Th- there are some pretty bad examples they have. Yeah, but. Is this going to be more performative or do you think they're really going to do an overhaul to make their system not perpetuate all these things? Okay, so I'm going to reserve my thoughts on Sketchy as a company and (laughs) focus more on the debate of like, is this going to actually lead to change? So I think it's a good step in the right direction that taking out racially charged things out of our education for like, watching cartoons to get a higher step score that's a that's a change in the right direction because now now when you take your test like you're probably going to see like oh african-american and then something about anemia and you'll you're going to think sickle cell immediately and that's just like very much so generalizing a very very heterogeneous population so i think it's a good thing that they're moving away from that I think there's other systemic changes that also need to be made, which we're kind of circling back to the first point of it starts from the ground up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Memo actually... to myself, do not approach sketchy for sponsorship. <laughs> but you also actually bring up a good point that like when you're studying for step and doing all of these things, anytime you see a patient and they have their race listed, you automatically think, well, okay, it's like sickle cell or it's like something that is like racially biased. We've probably talked about this on the show before. I forget. I'm assuming we have. But there is a problem there because then you go into clinic and you see like an African-American ba- and you just forget that all of the diseases that are generic can also apply to people of color as well. You just like see them like, and automatically your brain is going, oh, wait, no, it has to be this list of things, which is a problem because, no, they pro- they may not have sickle cell, actually, you because diseases are for everyone. <laughs> I'm going to put yeah. that on a T-shirt. Exactly. Disease <laughs> processes don't care about your race, ethnicity, or origins Disease processes are completely unsentient in that regard. It's mm-hmm. all about the biochemistry. Yeah. Yep. I hope that doesn't get construed, misconstrued as like, okay, so we shouldn't care about race in healthcare and then like not teach students to be aware of that like having differences in yeah. your lifestyle, your origins do actually play a factor, but it's not this overgeneralized just, factor it- of african-american equals sickle cell mm-hmm. but and it feels like this would be easy to fix where it's like just add like racial markers to questions that aren't stereotypically associated with that mm-hmm. like just like you don't have to say and I, I know that there's this thing of like oh if they put it in the step question it means it's important but i think that's a bad precedent to set just like stick them on different things like make you think beyond just the diseases limited to specific races and for that matter maybe just specify like specify caucasian people too because there's this thing well if the race isn't specified they're probably white just because that's where people's biases go so it's like just mm-hmm. do like swap it around a little bit more it just feels mm-hmm. like not that big of a like it wouldn't be that hard to fix <laughs> 
Yeah. And especially in like preclinicals. Like I think of the meme of the guy hitting the blue button. Like whenever you see a certain yes, race. Yes, we all like, know exactly uh, what you're talking person, about. Penal ketonuria. G6PD. Like, it's, <laughs> exactly. It's just, it's an overgeneralization. And then as soon as you go out into the real world, it breaks. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if any of you all saw this lawsuit on the part of black football players Mm -hmm. with the NFL talking about when apparently when they've been evaluating them for CTE, they've been like not as eligible for compensation because they've been presuming a lower (gasps) level of cognition from the beginning. So the the difference after, you know, after they've had concussions is, is smaller and therefore makes them less eligible for for support and all these players are like we weren't dumb to begin with what the fuck so yeah i thought i thought you were going towards the whole old pain difference like certain races don't don't feel pain the way there are people who still think that yeah it's on yeah (laughs) let's bring out some of the classics that are still uh popular today i thought thought that's where it was headed i was like oh my god like thicker skin it's it's the the stuff where they have thicker skin and stuff it's like (sighs) yeah yeah no it was uh i'm not i'm not gonna i'm not gonna like rate how like (laughs) the severity of how detrimental (laughs) these beliefs are because they're all horrible one to five which racist medical belief is (laughs) your favorite (laughs) we should play bingo and see which ones we've sounds like a buzzfeed quiz (laughs) it so does BuzzFeed, yeah. get in touch. You want to sponsor? Yes. <laughs> well, look, you guys. Uh, no, really? Way. What? Yes, Are you really. serious? What? Oh, we had so much What's fun. going on an hour and 10 minutes yeah. here? Yeah. You need to even fair. play Mad Libs for how... <laughs> 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 Which flaw in the American medical system? Uh, anyway. <clears throat> but that's yeah, our show. It like four well, minutes per minute of editing for this. So <laughs> yeah, we got we to gotta have uh, some... Some uh, a thought for AJ. A- AJ's right, in pain. Just you. like, please stop talking. I have to re-listen to all of this. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say no to more work being given to me. Just give me this. <laughs> ben, we were talking about medical student identity uh, before. Where does masochism fall in medical student identity? <laughs> Just give it to me. <laughs> Set your boundaries, AJ. Dave, Dave understands this. Okay. I set my Shut up, Aline. <laughs> well, that's our show. AJ, Aline, Nicole, Miranda, thank you for being on the show with me today. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. us. Long pause while he waits to be congratulated. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> and what kind of morselated tumor would I be if I didn't thank you, Short Coats, for making us a part of your week? If you're new here and you like what you heard today, follow the show wherever fine podcasts are available. Our editors are AJ Chowdhury and Eric Bozart. Alex Belzer is our marketing coordinator. The show is made possible by a generous donation by Carver College of Medicine Student Government and ongoing support from the Writing and Humanities Program. Our music is by Dr. Vox and Catmosphere. Talk to you in one week. Bye! Hi, short coats. Look, life in medical education, life in America, life in the world is often difficult. And I often wish I could help. All I have is this podcast, but in my wildest dreams, you have the support you need to lead a life of your choosing. You deserve to be happy, healthy, and successful in whatever ways you define those words. So if you need support because you've experienced racism, discrimination, harassment, mental health crises, I want you to be able to get the help that you need. And so I'm going to put some links in the show notes to some resources that you can use. But the bottom line is that for what it's worth, I see you. I know you're out there. I wish I could do more. Maybe I can in ways that I don't understand yet or know about. But I see you and I'm glad you're here and other people are too.